let's figure out how advanced PowerShell logging works and how we can use these features to our advantage. First things first, those settings are part of the group policy. So let's type edit group policy and open this up. Once it's open, we can go into the administrative templates and then it should be under Windows components. And then in Windows components, we'll have Windows PowerShell. And here there's a few options and these already sound like what we've been looking at before. Module logging, script block logging and transcription logs. So these are the three different features or settings that we want to explore a little bit more in depth now. So let's get our scripts that we need for this session. Let's go into the module one PowerShell and then just copy all of those scripts to our desktop. It's just the easiest way to do that. So we, here we have the scripts that we can run some tests with. Now we also need to observe those. And this is what we are going to use the event log explorer for. Let's open that one too. And then we have our PowerShell logs available. The first one right here, Windows PowerShell. And the second one, especially those features that we are going to be exploring are located in Microsoft Windows and then PowerShell operational log. We have to search a little. This is not all alphabetically sorted. So there you go. It's actually right here. We need to find this one PowerShell and then operational. Okay. So once you have that, all we need is Windows PowerShell one tab and Windows PowerShell operational in the second tab. So we can see there's already a bunch of events in here and also in the PowerShell log as well. So for our testing purposes, let's just go ahead and right click to clear this log and just say clear and same thing for operational. Let's go ahead and clear this log. So now we don't have any events anymore in this log. Now we can run some tests with those scripts in order to better understand what's being logged and how we can analyze those and detect those events. So now we have our scripts here. We have the event log explorer open. We just need to run our scripts now. And let's just use command line terminal to do so because that would actually allow us a very important thing. We actually have to start PowerShell engine every single time when we want to run a script. We don't want to be within the same PowerShell engine context for the entire session. So, so now important, we need to change directory to desktop. If you type there, you should see the files within this directory that we need, the PS1 files that we have on our desktop. So the first thing that we can do here is we can do type and just double check what's in this PS1 out of the PS1 file. It's basically just writing output in like a plain text string. So nothing special. Let's go ahead and execute this script by just typing PowerShell dash file. And then we can do out dot PS1. So now we just ran PowerShell, started the engine and loaded a script, which was called out.ps1 that was executed. In our logs, what does it mean? If we refresh our standard PowerShell logs, what we see here is the typical 600 events to start up the providers. And then finally the engine, the PowerShell engine, we can even see the host application that was executed was basically PowerShell and then including the script. So it was the PowerShell command. And then again, the process exited. In our PowerShell operational logs, we basically have a number of like five digit events. There's not much context to this. This is certainly indicator uh, that PowerShell was executed, but without much more context, we can only see here console startup. We don't really see much else that happened. It can be useful to at least have an indicator that something happened, that PowerShell was started, but we don't see much else here. So what can we do? Well, the first thing, if you remember early on that we have the PowerShell script block active by default only for suspicious commands. So which commands might be suspicious? The virtual alloc command was something that is 
potentially considered as suspicious. So let's print the output for the valloc.ps1 script. And this is not really anything that we need to go into details too much yet. What you see here is just basically loading the kernel 32 driver so that we can then allocate 1024 bytes using virtual alloc. And this is the whole point of the script. We just want to be using virtual alloc in a realistic way. So this is actually where we allocate one megabyte of size in the memory and then we just print whether it was actually failed or it was successful. So this now, as opposed to the previous script, which was just printing strings, actually is using virtual alloc with no settings that we changed whatsoever. It's the same settings, just a different script. Let's try this one now. PowerShell file valloc.ps1. Before we go ahead and do so, let's clear the event log again just making sure that we have we have a clean test environment. Then we hit enter. And so what happened to the script is that we just allocated random memory space on this address. So for us, that probably means if we refresh the regular PowerShell event log, again, PowerShell started up. And one thing that happened on top of this one was because it actually executed, we had a pipeline execution for this command. In this case, certainly helpful. Additionally, in our PowerShell operational log, if we refresh here, there's more to this, right? We have our typical five digit events, but now we have finally a 4104. And this 4104, as promised, now was actually able to log the entire content of our script. Now, if the script was to be way bigger and longer, and so, for example, we would not be able to fit everything in one event ID, you would actually have multiple script blocks. So there's script block one out of 30, for example, if you have a really long script. So you'd have to piece together multiple of these events, there's tools for this, to actually recover the entire script again. And then also we have a 4103. So this is our module logging. Our module, in this case, was able to log the command invocation, parameter bindings, and so on, as we've seen previously with the 800 event. And a very interesting part here is, if you have noticed the warning type here. So PowerShell warned us that this just executed because it actually matched our list of suspicious commands. So this is how 4104 works. We have a warning automatically if something suspicious executes and it gets locked as opposed to non-suspicious executions by default that are not being locked. So we can take this a little further, obviously. We can now go to our settings and we can now say PowerShell script lock logging. And if we edit this, now not configured, again, would only log suspicious. If we do enable and apply, this should now log everything that executes. So let's go back to our command prompt. Let's go and see what happens if we, if we execute the non-suspicious script, the out.ps1. So PowerShell-file out.ps1. Here's our text string. Let's go back here. So this is the last event. And if we refresh, So this is, these are the latest events. So we have startup indicators, and then we have 4104, hello cybersecurity hero, here's the output. And there's another informational event, but these are already indicated as verbose. So these are the ones that are potentially not as much of interest as the ones that are, have a warning. And now here's one thing where we can take this even further. Let's clear the logs. Let's see what other scripts we have available. So we have played around with out.ps1 and vialloc.ps1. We have base64 encoded code. Now let's use the vialloc 
dash base 64 script to show you something really interesting. Let's just type it. Hitting tab, so we get the base 64 version. And so what attackers often do is executing PowerShell EXE with an encoded command. So we would not be able to, for example, read if it's a malicious payload, it's obfuscated, sometimes even encrypted. But this, mes this message string here is obviously just base64 encoded. One, key one way how we can check what's in there is by just opening Cyberchef, the most common tool for converting payloads, and copy the string from base64. Make it a little prettier, we're just going to remove null bytes. So this is a basic command. This is just write host, then tweet virtual alloc. So this is the text. And this is just the write host command for PowerShell. So what we want is executing PowerShell that is going to write tweet virtual alloc. Virtual alloc, again, is our keyword. So we had it as a function earlier. What happens if we just have it as a string in a standard output? For this, we have to go ahead and edit script block logging to just default, because we want to test the default setting that happens when we execute the script. And then we should also see something additionally magically happen. Let's just go ahead and PowerShell file vlog the script so we can execute it. Script ran, we have tweet virtual alloc. Now over to our operational log and uh, refresh. Okay, great. So we have a bunch of indicators. PowerShell was started and we still, we got our warning again. And our warning is showing us the payloads. And interestingly, if we look into this here, the payload was this. Base64 encoded, but we can see plain text payload here. And that's the magic of script lock. You can actually get the deobfuscated payloads of a script in this log. And this is also another really, really interesting feature if we are focusing on the 4104 events. Now, one additional thing that we can also set is we were talking about transcription logs. Let's click on the transcriptions and do enable. And we can just do apply. It's technically asking us for a directory because remember, this is the text-based logging. So we just do okay, enable this one. And now we need to run another script. We can just go back here and we can just run the same script again. It doesn't really matter. So PowerShell file vlog base64. So we just ran this one again after we've enabled transcription logging. And this is a setting that should write files into our documents folder. So we just have this folder appear now. And now we have log files. There is a log that just log PowerShell. So this is basically what was printed in our terminal, the command invocation and the output that we have in this log here. Not in event logs, but actually as a text log in our documents folder by default. So this is also another really interesting way of recovering or logging PowerShell events. And uh, there's a lot of options, as you can see. Hopefully, this made sense that you get a better understanding of which events and logs can provide what kind of details. Also, this is something if you are working in real-world environments and production environments, all of these features and events can potentially generate a lot of noise. So it's always up to you to tune those to find out what applications you have running, to have applications that are using a lot of PowerShell, uh, your administrators using a lot of PowerShell. In that case, you probably will have a little bit of a harder time to tune those and adjust those, but it's never going to be a reason to not log those events and store them somewhere so that you have them available and have actually visibility and can create detection on activity around PowerShell. This is a very important feature and hopefully something that would enable you to use this to your own advantage.